The term Panzer Cruiser literally means armored cruiser. The term battle cruiser was not used in Germany until after World War I. In Germany, the battle cruiser type were referred to in official documents as Große Cruiser, or large cruisers, but the men of the Imperial Navy usually referred to them as Panzer Cruiser, and this is how the Contra Admiral Vice Admiral Hipper referred to the ships of his. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Historical Gamer once again. And today I'm going to be doing a really brief book review. And if anything, it's actually more of a book hawking. Um, and what I mean by that is I'm talking about a book that I honestly have nothing bad to say about. Um, other than maybe I wish it covered more than just battle cruisers. Uh, if you remember on the channel a couple of months ago or actually maybe a year or two ago, I talked about buying this really interesting book about the German battle cruisers during World War I. And I never really got a chance to sit down and review it or talk about it more formally or do anything like that. And so this video is me going to be doing that. Now, if you see footage in here, there will be sort of probably a cross between some footage from the actual book and World of Warships. Um, so if there's any gaming footage I put in here, that's what it's from. But you'll see a lot of pictures from this book, because this is really a visual book in many ways. The book that I'm going to be talking about today is called German Battle Cruisers of World War I, Their Design, Construction, and Operations. The book is by Gary Staff, and the illustrations in the book are by Mardson Samuel. It is, in many ways, a book that is like sort of the old Jane's Fleet books, you know, Jane's Warships of the World, that kind of a thing. But it's if those books had the ability and time to dive into their subject matter in a much better level of detail than they really do. If you've ever bought one of the old Jane's books, or even Conway's Warships of the World, you know, one of the old classics, I believe that came out in the 1990s, uh, these were massive books that were essentially encyclopedias of the navies of the world, and they gave you every single ship at a period of time that research can tell us existed, a little bit of a history, usually like a paragraph about each ship or each class, and then detailed specs lists about those ships. What were the caliber of guns? What was the belt armor? What was the deck armor? When were they laid down? When were they commissioned? Who were their commanding officers? Those kinds of things. And often commanding officers went even beyond what these books provided. But they always sort of had, you know, pictorials or, or diagrams that gave you blueprints and things like that if you were really into naval history. And I know I've been playing a fair amount of Rule the Waves lately. Uh, I've been, obviously you're seeing World of Warships in front of you. I've really delved into the naval history side of things on this channel over the last couple of years. Really with Rule the Waves, and I expect with Rule the Waves 2, you will see something similar. And I'm thinking about doing a new Rule of Wave series playing as the Confederate States of America as sort of a follow-on to my Ultimate General Civil War series where I won independence for the South. Uh, Rule of Waves does have a game mode where you can play as the Confederates, and it would be fun to kind of create this alternative history and claim it all ties back to Ultimate General. But that's neither here nor there. Today I'm talking about this book, German Battle Cruisers. And this book, I mean, just the opening cover is phenomenal. You've got... A, and you'll probably see it on the screen in front of you right now, you've got a full 3D rendering, for example, of the SMS von der Tann. And just for those of you who are less versed in the German Navy, SMS during the period of the Kaiser's reign, SMS is sort of the German designation for their ships. So in the British Navy, you have HMS, either his or her majesty's ship. In the United States, you have USS for United States ship. In the German Navy, you have SMS, uh, which is essentially saying the same thing. I'm not going to try and pronounce it again. Um, and you've got this image of the SMS von der Tann. It has the basics that would be in Jane's, for example, the length, the, the beam, the draw, the displacement, the armament, the speed, the range. But then this full 3D image of this vessel, which, you know, you never would have gotten a full color 3D image of this vessel in the real world because it was built in the early 1900s. You know, it was commissioned in 1911. You have 3D renderings of what the deck would look like. Uh, it gives you sort of a left view, a right view. So these images that you would typically get in a Jane's book for a ship with, with pictures taken, but in full color rendering. And it's just sort of an example of the quality that you're going to expect in this book. You know, as you open the page, you get some nice... Uh, black and white footage of some of the ships, and then you get to the, the table of contents, and you just get an example of how much detail this book is going to dive into. Uh, for example, the first chapter deals all with the SMS von der Tann, uh, the first of the German armored cruisers, or battle cruisers as they were. 
Uh, armored cruiser is probably a little bit confusing of a term because when we think of armored cruisers, we think of uh, the um, Oh my goodness! I, I'm blanking out on on what the what the Admiral von Scheer's uh, squadron, his two armored cruisers that uh, participated in World War One and defeated the British in the Pacific before being crushed by the British battle cruisers at the Battle of the Falklands. Oh my goodness! Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. That's right. Um, and when you think of armored cruisers, you think of those things. You know, the old pre-dreadnought version of the armored cruiser. Well, the Germans called them the same thing, but they were battle cruisers. And the von der Tann was the first of the German battle cruisers. Uh, and it covers 50 pages. The first chapter, 50 pages, page 11 to 61, all about the von der Tann. From its original design, it gives you blueprints, it gives you some information about the hull, gives you information about the armor, it even gives you pictorials and information about the artillery shells that were fired from its main guns, gives you armor layouts, it gives you photographs of uh, the turbines or whatnot as the ship's being constructed. Uh, it just gives you a huge amount of information, pictures from the ship being launched, its operational history, which, you know, deals before the war. It, it had a trip to South America, for example, photographs from, from those... Uh, um, those trips, reports from the captain about about some interesting information from those ships or the performance of the vessel, um, all this really incredibly exciting and detailed information. And then it also gives you detailed of its combat operations during World War I. So again, photographs of its guns firing, uh, detailed maps and diagrams of where the ship was during different operations. For example, right now, as I'm kind of talking to you about this, I'm looking at uh, a map of the uh, the battle cruisers movements during the bombardment of Scarborough in December of 1914 mining operations in, in to uh, Schwarta Bank in April of 1915 uh, it gives you pictures of the vessel during the winter uh, in Wilhelmshaven harbor during 1914 uh, some photographs of the captain and then it goes into you know the historical very well-known battles of Jutland and whatnot. It shows you where, shar well, sh where shell damage hit the ship. You actually get armored diagrams of where the incoming shell of various calibers hit the ship, the impact on the ship, the influence of the armor, you know, how the shell was, was either deflected by the armor, where it struck the armor, or, you know, where it penetrated into the ship. You get photographs after the actual battle of the damage of the vessel once it returned to Wilhelmshaven. Um, you know, the dry dock footage of the ship once it's raised out of the water. You can see the actual shell impact point. Detailed diagrams, blueprint-type diagrams, and pictures of the internal compartments and what they looked like. And this is all just for the SMS von der Tann, the first of the German battle cruisers. The introduction does deal with, I'm sure a lot of you are like, it wasn't really the first, the Blucher was the first. Um, the in introduction actually deals a little bit with the Blucher, the first of the German heavy armored cruisers which was really intended to respond to the initial British battle cruisers. Uh, but by the time it was actually all of the material was bought for it, the Germans figured out, oh crap, it's not going to be an armored cruiser. The British aren't building an armored cruiser. It doesn't have eight or nine inch guns. It has 12 inch guns. This thing that we're building, that we're spending millions and millions of dollars on, the Blucher, uh, is going to be horribly obsolete. It's going to be slower. It's going to be less well armed. And it's not going to be able to stop British uh, shells. And so the British sort of changed the game in building the, uh, I believe it was the Invincible, uh, which is the first of their battle cruisers. And the Germans had already started building a response based on intelligence that they thought was it was going to going to have, and it ended up being wholly inadequate. The book really doesn't deal beyond that introduction, talking about how the German battle cruisers would end up coming to be, because the Blucher was deemed to be essentially completely. Uh, incapable of fighting in the line of battle as the British had intended. The book really doesn't deal too much into that. Uh, you know, other than saying that this happened and this is where the Fond and the later German battle cruisers came from. And while I'm talking about all of this detail for just the Fond this deals with every single one of these ships. So you've got 50 pages on the Fond You've got 47 pages on the Mokta, the second of the German large cruisers, uh, the large cruiser of 1908. Uh, for example, Chapter 2, the large cruiser of 1908, G, Mokta. Uh, chapter 3, the large cruiser, cruiser of 1909, H, Goeben. In the... The letter designation was given by the German Navy as they were planning these ships out. So the Goeben is a little bit shorter, which is interesting to me because it, it, it has sort of the one of the more flashy 
uh, periods of history of the ship because it switches over into the uh, into the uh, Austro-Hungarian, or sorry, oh my goodness, the Ottoman Empire's uh, service after a sort of uh, famous flight through uh, the Mediterranean at the outbreak of World War One. Then you have the Seidlitz, the Dörfingler, uh, the Lutzow, the Hindenburg, the Mackensen, the Graf Spee, uh, and the Erste Blücher, some vessels which didn't uh, end up completing. So again, you have all this detail, 328 pages of glorious, glossy, hardcover detail. This is just I mean, if you're into naval history and you're into things like Jane's warships of the world or uh, Con or Jane's fleets or uh, Conway's warships of the world, and you were ever wondering, you know, it'd be really great if I had a book like this, but it went into more detail, you know, something more than what I can find on Wikipedia or the million other wiki-like sites out there today. And I want a detailed history of the ship, its design, its design philosophies. There's a piece in the introduction that's talking about Kaiser Wilhelm writing a letter to a naval magazine, sort of decrying the expense of cruisers and how, um, you know, they're essentially, there's a very dangerous precedent that's being set. And he had a valid point that cruisers before the battle cruisers come into being, cruisers are becoming more and more expensive and becoming more and more like battleships and that their displacement is nearly mirroring battleships. In some cases, French cruisers were larger than battleships and his his sort of argument was like listen if you're going to spend this much money on cruisers and they're basically going to cost the same amount of money as a battleship why the heck are we doing this in the first place just build a battleship it's kind of like all right that's a little bit of a simple way to look at it but it's also somewhat true um and if you were ever wondering like hey what was some of the design philosophy behind this? Or what was the detailed operational history of some of these really fascinating German ships? Uh, this is the book for you. Um, again, you know, I'm looking at a page right now of Seidlitz uh, as it hits uh, its second hit that it received. Sorry if there's any noise in the background there. That's my dog. Um, there's a diagram here. Seidlitz, hit number two that it received at the Battle of Dodger Bank. And then it gives you sort of, here's the, the armor that it provides here, a cross-section of frame 68 in the vessel. The armored deck is 155 millimeters. Uh, there's a 300 millimeter shell, I believe, that comes in. Here's where it penetrates. Here's where it kind of comes through near the starboard armor, uh, the hole. Um, you, you have a section here that says, damage to Seidlitz, hit one. This hit was made at 10... 43 by a base fused 13.5 inch shell containing a burster of black powder the shell struck battery deck at frame 30 and passed through it and then struck the barbet of d turret it detonated against the 230 millimeter thick krupp cemented armor and most of the ex explosive effect was outside the barbet but the barbet was ho was hold and the outside of the hole was 350 millimeters by 350 millimeters the inside was 600 millimeters by 700 millimeters there was considerable Centric cracks around the hole. The eight millimeter thick barbet deck was torn up and the wooden deck was splintered. Splinters of armor entered the barbet and penetrated the turret supporting cylinder and turntable shaft. Ferocious flames and flash from the munitions present enveloped the turret and poisonous gases filled the aft part of the ship. And then it moves on to hit number two, moves on to hit number three. Conclusions after the Battle of Dodger Bank. After one near cat catastrophic hit on Seidlitz, there was a searching inquiry into what happened and why. As Capitan Z C. Eddy put it, Afterwards, a thorough examination showed that everything had been done in accordance with regulations. I told the gunnery officer if we lose 190 men and almost the whole ship in accordance with regulations, then there was something. Then they are somehow wrong. So we made technical improvements and changed our methods of training as well as the regulations. So again, not to bore you with reading through this massive book, but it just gives you an example of some of the minutia that it goes into, and that may not be for everybody. You don't have to dive into all of that. Um, minutia here for example there's a there's just sort of an interesting it's very approachable it's very readable there's a nice little bit here about the effort to save the sidelets as it was hit and sort of its damage as it's kind of coming back uh from the sh from uh, one of its battles but it's just it's a really interesting book and i know i've been talking about this for probably longer than i intended to we're almost to 15 minutes now uh but i put a link in the description this is a book that I've wanted to talk about for a while. I will admit that the link in the description, if you do click it and you do buy it, I will get a percentage of that. That's not why I'm promoting this book. If anybody here has looked at my channel over the last however many years, occasionally I do book reviews, and some of them are not very positive. For example, Ghost Fleet. I just tore that book 
uh, a part uh, in my concerns and problems with it. And so I'm not trying to say that everything I say here is, you know, you should go out and buy all these all these books and the occasional thing that I talk about. Uh, but I am saying in this case, to me, this is a book that if it's the right, if you're the right audience for it, it is amazing. And also the other pieces, it, it makes a great coffee table book, right? Like in the sense of this is one of those kind of pretty interesting books. It It's not all text. It's not 300 and whatever pages of text. You open it up. There's a lot of images. There's a lot of graphs. There's even these 3D renderings of these ships for all of these battle cruisers. It is a book that is not cheap, but it's also worth it in my opinion. And again, if you're if you're the kind of personality like me and you haven't stumbled upon this book already, I recommend you go out and buy it. But with that being said, Again, don't feel like you need to. This is just occasionally, maybe like six or seven times a year, I make a, I make a movie about uh, or a video about a book that I've read or talk about it, and sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's not. But this is one of those rare cases where I think everything about it is great, and I really recommend it highly. There's a Kindle version, I think, uh, as well. But really, if in my opinion, if you're not buying the uh, the hardcover uh, version that I think you're kind of getting, uh, you're, you're shorting yourself of the experience. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to double check um, to make sure that there is a Kindle version. Yeah, there is a Kindle version. Oh, wow, the hardcover is more expensive than I remembered it being. Um, it's a fair amount of money. I mean, the Kindle version itself is like almost 50 bucks. Uh, so it's not exactly cheap, but... Yeah. I guess the Kindle version could be nice if you had like a big, big version of an iPad or a tablet or something like that. And you wanted to scroll through some of this stuff. Um, in my opinion, you're shorting yourself if you're not getting the hardcover version. And there's used versions for a lot less. Um, so you can save almost over $25 right now if you buy one of the used versions. I don't know what kind of shape it's in. Or you can buy the, the, the regular. Anyway, this is enough of me rambling. You can find a link in the description to this book if it's interesting to you. If not, ignore this video. Um, it's been a while, little while uh, since I have um, put out a video, guys. Sorry, I had a couple of real life things going on that have prevented me from being able to make much lately. But rest assured, there will be more close combat historical discussions. There will be more uh, discussions about um, sort of Ultimate General Civil War. I, I, sorry, Ultimate General Gettysburg. I'm returning to the original of the series, which is a very different game and very interesting as well. And uh, other projects which are also in the offing, as I mentioned, the Rule the Waves project and a couple of other things that are on the docket. So rest assured, I'm working on several things, uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know your thoughts below. And if you've read this book or seen this book, also kind of provide your own take and your own thoughts on it. What I really, I guess the one thing I wish that this book had, which it does not, is I wish that there was an equivalent to this, which looks at the German Navy. There are other books out there, certainly, that look at the battleships of the Royal Navy, the, the German Navy. They all seem to be a little bit about the same length, but they're covering like three to four times as many ships. So I kind of wonder if, all right, if you're covering 30 battleships and 300 pages, it's obviously not going to be in this level of detail. So I kind of wonder what's really in those. Um, are they more just sort of surface level histories are they more text-based histories do they really give the same level of detail and attention that this book does i would love if there was a second volume for this book even if it was more expensive that looked at all the german battleships in world war one and likewise for the british navies i think it would be fascinating it's an interesting topic and uh the british navy has a lot of stuff out there on it the german navy a little bit less so it's interesting to see this this one out there and, and i'm i've enjoyed it immensely and i hope you guys uh can can sort of share your thoughts as well. But with that being said, guys, that's enough of me rambling about this book. It's not an in-depth book review or anything like that. It's just me talking about some things with this book that got me really excited that I wanted to share with all of you. Um, okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed. This has been a little bit of a weird video, but I hope you guys enjoyed. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out. thought I just shot. I guess not. You have F-22 in your name? Maybe that's why. <clears throat> 22. Of course, if you have the F-35, everything will just break. <laughs>